All right. Well, let's see if we can get through chapter seven. Um, what's that? <laughs> I was going to say, start at, Denver, at verse 17. That's where I like. Yeah, well, we do, we do want to get a little context again. So just, just to re- recap, we'll just jump in here. Uh, flee sexual immorality. And then we talked about the body being, uh, when Paul talks about the body in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 6 anyway, he's not referring to the individual bodies. He's referring to the, the corporate body, the body of the congregation, right? Is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Right, and that will come up again when he talks about um, when they when they sin, they think that of their sin as just being an individual, private thing, or like communing is just between them and God. But it's actually, you know, when when they receive the sacrament unworthily, they're sinning against the body that is the church, that is their congregation. So um, that that's going to come up again in chapter eleven and fifteen. But then he does have this this whole chapter on marriage, and I suggested to you that this is um, has a format that's like. Uh, I, I, I'd love to draw it, but I don't have a drawing apparatus here, but um, where it's like there's a central theme in the middle, and it works towards the theme, and then it works its way back out from that theme. And so you hear mirror things on both sides of the theme. So you hear about marriage be, at the beginning and the end. You'll hear about um, uh, remaining single you know, before at, in two spots. You'll hear about um, widows, I think, in two spots as well. So... He seems to be a little repetitive, but that's intentional. He's, he makes the point, he, or he makes gives some examples to make his point, and then coming out of the point, he repeats the examples, but maybe in a different way. If that does that follow? All right. So uh, <laughs> yeah, well, and I and I suggested to you that um, the central theme is right is right there in verse seventeen, but as mm-hmm. God has just distributed to each one as the lord has called each one so let him walk and so i ordain in all the churches right so he's speaking i ordain in all the churches he's he's setting up that that standard um, as an apostle so he's speaking with apostolic authority there and he doesn't always speak with apostolic authority but he certainly does there all right and this this is actually a great statement i i appreciate that you uh, wanted to draw our attention to that because um He's talking to converts to Christianity, and he's and he's referring them to remain vocationally where they've been put. All right, and um, this is always a, a problem. Um, I mean, I've even faced this in my own life. You know, I was working in retail sales, and then you know, there's the temptation to say, "Well, I'm going to go to seminary because it's a higher calling." Right? To be a pastor is, you know, more virtuous or more important, um, and it isn't um, because as you know, in retail sales, I mean, there were people that that actually had really in-depth conversations about faith and life with. Um, you know, I don't need to give any examples. And some of them were like, you know, what? Can you be my like rabbi while I'm while you're at seminary? And like, you know, I'll I'll send you money to help you at seminary. And I'm like, I can't really do that. <laughs> you know, they wanted me to be like their personal guru um, because it, things would. I mean, some of these people spent a lot of money from me, but they also, you know, that just meant that we got to know each other. And, um, you know, they would, they would ask, you know, I, I couldn't help but speak of, you know, my faith or my life that way. So it was interesting. Um, so, you know, you can, be, you can be a Christian within whatever vocation you've been placed, given that that vocation is not um, against God's command, right? So... Um, in regards to being single or divorced, um, this, you know, that's what he's going to be dealing with here. So, yeah, I mean, be a Christian where you've been put. I think that's important. And you don't have to seek it out. I mean, uh, Ron, you mentioned, you know, Jim and in the mission trips. Mission trips are wonderful um, because, well, there's a number of things that maybe we can do. Like if you're a skilled laborer, you know, you can go and um, do something that maybe they don't have the talent to. Um, my mom's just, you know, here, you were in the Peace Corps and you went to a place that, you know, Burr. could you, yeah, you, they could use your, your service. It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily, I mean, you did it probably partly because you were a Christian, but, but it's also just being a good neighbor, right? But it also worked because when we got there, you know, we didn't even know it. There was a Lutheran church on our island. We went to Antigua. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And then we got to, you know, uh, Ron drove the little van around to pick up all the people to come to church. And I got to teach in the Sunday school, play the organ that you had to do this with your feet. Right, the pump like organ. 
right? Oh my gosh, it's hard enough to play <laughs> without having to do that. <laughs> How long ago was it? Oh, that was when we were first married. They oh. called us on a, um, in February, it's snowing outside, and they called from the Peace Corps and said, um, say, we wondered if you'd want to go to the Caribbean, you know, as soon as you graduate here in May. So I asked, I just covered the receiver, said, Ron, what do you think? Go to the Peace Corps um, in the Caribbean in May? He said, sure. Yeah, why not? <laughs> that was that. <laughs> right. What year was it? Maybe you... Uh, 75, um, was it, that you went? No, we went in 76. 76, yeah. Joan and I were in what was called the Prince of Peace Corps with the Lutheran Church. There was such a thing? There was back in the late 60s and early 70s, and I think it, it probably went through the mid-70s or maybe the late 70s even. Um, we didn't know were, about it. Joan and I were down in Venezuela for two years, and there were several couples that went down there after us, so I know it lasted. Right. Wow. In the 70s. And what was really fascinating, just recently, like a year or two ago, um, we had kind of a reunion with the, some of the missionaries who now live, you know, mostly in Illinois and, and uh, Missouri. And, um, and some of and the Peace Corps uh, people that were, that followed us were there also. So we got to reconnect with them again. That's that was cool. cool. That was neat. Yeah. It is neat. Yeah, because we, we still are in contact with the pastor's wife that uh, was at that it was a wisconsin lutheran church but hey mm -hmm. yeah. we were cool <laughs> oh, sorry i got us off course here <laughs> no it's okay i mean the point i was going to try to make with that i mean because i i did a similar thing it was only three weeks but in siberia um you know is those are formative experiences and they're, they're also you know helpful to kind of give you perspective um but ultimately, I mean, you serve where you where you are, you know. So within your occupation, within you know your family, within your immediate community, um, that's where you have the most opportunity. And we'll talk about that a little bit when it comes to marriage with the two examples he gives. So, um, so I think we we did ten and eleven. So um, we'll just recap that, and then we'll move on because I I think we said the next subject was a little bit heavy. So now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. All right, so remember we talked about this. He, he will indicate to you whether he's speaking as an apostle, whether he's speaking just a pastoral opinion, or whether he's speaking God's word, right? Mm -hmm. And here when he says, a wife is not to depart from her husband, this is straight up Jesus talk, right? <laughs> um, an Old Testament talk. Um, so, you know, think Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount, right? Uh, Mark 10, Luke 16, Malachi 2, so many examples um, that is forbidden. Divorce is forbidden. But even if she does depart, so this is, again, he's talking to converts. So in the event that she has divorced, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. This is also very interesting because we don't know the context exactly. We didn't talk about this last week. But um, in Roman society, a uh, um, a woman could initiate the divorce. Now, in Jewish society, that wasn't true. But in, in the Roman society, they could, right? Especially, I mean, she might be actually the wealthy one. It's, it's very different than Jewish society. So um, what, what appears to have been happening, and there's some evidence of this, is that <clears throat> there were women who were divorcing their unbelieving husband, and they were doing it because they thought of it like, like being a nun, being a higher spiritual calling. Uh, wow. And... Yeah, and that, you know, they took Jesus' teaching about that in, that in heaven there would be, you know, there is no husband or wife because we're all jointly, you know, the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. And so then they, they just, uh, what we talked, we talked about this word. I, I've used it, and maybe it's worth defining again, but ascetic. It's A-E-S-C, yeah, A A E S C T I C. I see, yeah. Yeah, and it basically means like, um, well, I'm just going to, ascetic. What, how do they do Asceticism from the Greek, ascasis, is a lifestyle characterized by abstinence from sensual pleasures, often for the purpose of pursuing spiritual goals. So this was like the opposite of what Corinth was all about. Because <laughs> Corinth was all like, just embrace sensualism, you know, 
and uh, with the temple prostitutes and all of that. And so then they went the other ditch. We talked about the two ditches and falling off in a ditch. So it appears that there were women that were doing this, that were divorcing their husband in order to like be more spiritual. And Paul has some things to say about that. And, and that's because, of course, um, marriage is given as part of the order of creation. It's not particularly Christian, actually. Um, and there are monogamous, you know, uh, mon monogamy is the, is the norm for, for marriage around the world, um, even in non-Christian cultures. Um, that isn't to say there aren't exceptions, even in the Bible, but that is, that is the norm. Um, so a husband does not divorce his wife. So you have that part two, uh, which doesn't seem to be maybe as common because he puts it in that second position. <laughs> there are women divorcing their husband, but not the other way around. But, but to the rest, I, and notice here he says, not the Lord. All right. So now he says, okay, I'm going to give you some counsel. Right, and I, this I don't think this is an apostolic um, teaching here. This is just Paul being pastor. So uh, a little bit more opinion, maybe. If any brother has a wife who does not believe, and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. All right. So if a brother that's a, that's a brother in the congregation has a wife who isn't a believer, um, don't divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. So again, marriage is good. It's given by God in creation. If they can make it work, you know, let it be. For the unbelieving husband, and that we didn't talk about this expression, I don't think. Or did we? No, okay. Unbelieving like husband is sanctified by the wife. All right, and that, this word sanctified is going to, that's the one that's probably is, is going to be our hang up. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, <laughs> um, but now they are holy. Actually, it's the same word as sanctified, by the way. That's just nominative versus the verb, right? The noun versus the verb. All right. So what is Paul talking about here? Is, is the unbelieving husband made a believer by the wife? Well, that does happen sometimes. I think we talked about that. It does happen sometimes, right? But but the unbelieving husband isn't automatically like now a believer without faith, just because by virtue of being joined to a believing wife, as if right. like her, her faith now like had super power, like a, what do you want to say? Like a force field that kind of enveloped the whole household and brought everybody into the church, like a bubble or something. That's not what he's talking about. He's just talking about how um, the wife's um, faith actually is going to guide her behavior. And it is actually going to be a better marriage. It's, it's going to bring um, holiness to the marriage by her, um, by her, because of her faith, right? And the same thing um, for an unbelieving wife with, with a, a God-fearing husband, right? He's going to be a better husband to her. He's going to be a husband in the way of the Lord, in the way that the Lord gives, uh, which is going, you know, it is going to sanctify their marriage. I mean, it's not going to, well, for one thing, he might actually forgive her, right? Which we don't usually see all that terribly much in non-believing um, marriages. We see something that I guess resembles forgiveness sometimes, but not mm -hmm. the forgiveness of Christ applied, right? And then talking about the children, and I think that's the important point. It's, it's interesting that Paul dry, um, draws to that. Um, I had, I, speaking of my, my retail job, I had this really remarkable, it was a friend of the owner of the store, uh, but he was a customer too. Uh, he was a Jewish lawyer, um, high profile Jewish lawyer. So he was basically retired at age 40 because he did like, um, like, uh, like situations where a community's uh, water supply had been tainted by a, a chemical plant down the street. And so large, what do they call it? It was class action lawsuit, right? The whole town sues the chemical company. Yeah. So big payouts. <laughs> and he won these cases. So just extremely wealthy. He married this Baptist gal from Tennessee who happened to be a model too, which was kind of funny. So yeah, who was 20 years younger than him? Because I knew him. He was probably, I don't know, probably going on 60 at this point. And she was, under, she was, she was younger than I was. So, <laughs> but they had young kids too. So now what do you do with the kids? So what they did, they figured this out that, um, they would go to church with her on Sunday, but they would go to Sabbath school on Wednesday, and then they would keep the Sabbath with dad, although dad was like nominally Jew, so, you know, only like holidays and that sort of thing. So 
you have to wonder, like, what happens to these kids? They're confused. Yeah, they're very confused. Well, it's just like generic religion. Mom has hers, dad has hers. They probably were more regular in Sabbath school than they were in church because mom, mom wasn't all that terribly Christian either as far as her um, discipline of it. Um, so this question, thinking of that situation, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. It's the same thing that if one parent is a believing um, Christian, it's going, to, it's going to change the whole parenting dynamic in the home. And those children are less likely, I would say, than to suffer abuse or, um, you know, uh, inappropriate discipline or that kind of thing, right? Um, is, it, is it that they're going to be automatically a Christian? Not necessarily, um, but God willing, yeah. Especially if, if the dad is, is a believer, then that's more likely the case in the ancient world and even today. So this word sanctified, I mean, we think of it in terms of like saved forever in eternity, you know, through the forgiveness of sins, right? That that's what it means. Um, but it can mean set apart in, in more of a, um, well, in the sense that, that the husband or wife here that's believing is different than an unbelieving husband or wife. They've been set apart by God and they have, um, well, they have gifts that they'll bring to the marriage that you wouldn't otherwise get, right? And, and especially forgiveness. Does that follow so far? Well, sort of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's two different it's ways confusing. that there's two different ways that people approach this text, and and the way that they categorize it is that there's an optimistic view and a pessimistic view. Mm. And I just gave you the pessimistic view, not because I'm a pessimist, just because I don't think that's what Paul Paul is not he's not talking about like marry the unbeliever and you'll convert them. Um, I never counsel people to do that, and I've only seen that go sideways. I've never seen that go well. Where you say to somebody, you know what, you'll work out your faith later on. You just, you guys love each other. Just get married, and then you can work that out. It's like, don't do that. And you know, um, well, I guess we, it seems seems to contradict. I mean, not studying it all the way through yet, but uh, mm -hmm. the Old Testament, where when the Jewish uh -huh. people came came back from, uh, yeah, from uh, Babylon, they uh, or wherever it was. It does contradict the Old Testament. This is absolutely told, true. Told them they had to get rid of their their foreign wives or their unbelieving wives. That's right. That's right. So you have prohibitions against marrying an unbeliever in Deuteronomy seven, and Joshua twenty three, First Kings eleven, Ezra nine. <laughs> so it's all over. It's all over. The question, the question I was going to bring up, may, maybe uh, Paul. Well, of course, he's speaking to us also, but um, um, it could it be that he was speaking to people who had just come to the faith. Correct. Yep. Who, who had married an unbeliever without having right. any reason not to. Right. We don't want to take verse 14 out of context. It comes right after 13, which is mm -hmm. talking about not divorcing, 12 and 13. Don't divorce. Why? Because you can probably make something of it, right? I mean, there's not a good reason to, to break it off if they're willing you know, to work it out, right? Uh, but, but then, cause in verse 15, he, then he says, well, look, if the unbelieving spouse leaves, just let them go. I mean, you can't, you can't change it. If they're not willing to remain married to you because you're a Christian now, you got to let them go. It's just, it's just like Jesus says, you got to be willing to leave behind father and mother, you know, wife and, uh, you know, children and whatever for my sake and for the gospel. Right. And that, so that's Paul's. Yeah. Again, this is all like pastoral counsel. And this is what drives people crazy about, um, <laughs> about pastors. Right, because if you don't have a clear word from God, then all you can say is, "Here's my opinion," you know. And then you're like, and and it's usually a question because there's, if there is no direct counsel from God, it's probably because it's a messy, mixed up situation where there is no good answer, <laughs> you know. And um, ultimately, somebody's going to get hurt, and it's just not going to go well. So again, this is just Paul. What he says in seventeen: just stay where you are, right? And 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 in a sense, God will work it out, right? If they're willing to stay with you, God's going to bless your marriage. If he's not willing, if he, he or she's not willing to stay, just let him go. You're not under, you're not under any, you know, bondage in that case, right? God is not there. What, what's when it, with Jesus talks about marriage? He says, he repeats Genesis and says, "What God has put together, let God, no, you know, no man separate or rend asunder." Right? So if the person, if the unbeliever departs, that's God's doing in effect, um, and just let him go. You're not under bondage in such case. But God has called us to peace, and I think that's the important word here. He's like, the, the Christian faith is not about dividing homes. 
Sometimes that happens, but it's going to happen for the sake of Jesus and for the gospel, right? But not it, it's not because you just, well, now you're a believer and your spouse isn't, so you used to split up. It's really interesting in Fort Wayne when I was uh, there as a seminary student, we heard we had a um, missionary to the Hmong people in Fort Wayne. We have a lot of those in Sheboygan too, more in Sheboygan than I think Fort Wayne. And there were like 14 Buddhist temples in Fort Wayne, and they're, they're all from, from these Hmong, the Hmong people. Anyway, um, the missionary would talk about how he required the father to attend the baptism of, of their children, even if he was going to remain a Buddhist. So mom and kids convert, dad doesn't. Um, inter interesting thing about Buddhism is that most of them aren't very militant. So they, they're like, you know, whatever, you know, you just believe what you want to believe. I believe what I believe. They're that kind of, they're pretty cool. But he required dad to be there because he didn't, he wanted dad to not only witness the baptism and hear the confession of faith, ultimately that's the most important reason, but, but also because he's not trying to, he, he wanted to demonstrate to these um, com to the community that he wasn't trying to drive families apart because uh, that family is very very important to them uh, more important than it is to us even i think so uh, yeah so be wise about that don't you, there's no reason to cause um contention that way although sometimes you know um we do get into think of like grandparents versus their children and when the grandkids don't get bat aren't baptized and don't get to hear the hear the gospel and you know, you see all sorts of contention in family over that. And if there's going to be contention, let it be over that. You know, it doesn't make it easier, but, but there you go. Uh, and then, but he does say, you know, how do you know a wife, whether you will save your husband, meaning whether he will come to faith or how do you know a husband, whether you will save your wife? You don't know. So there's no reason to separate from them. All right. And what, and that's, again, that's more of a pessimistic view. The optimistic view is, well, you probably will. Um, the pessimistic view is, well, you don't really know. But I think that's what Paul's saying. So again, this is all just pastoral wisdom, care. I think it's an extension of the truth that divorce is not good. And um, yeah, so that's pretty straightforward, maybe, now. But this this bit in 14 has hung up a lot of people, <laughs> you know. I, I was just reading what the uh, footnotes say in this text that I have. Um, on verse 14, I'll just read it. Yeah, the blessings that flow to to believers don't stop there, but extend to others. God regards the marriage as sanctified, set apart for His use, by the presence of the one Christian spouse. The other does not receive salvation automatically, but is helped by this relationship. The children of such a marriage are to be regarded as holy because of God's blessing on the family unit until they are old enough to decide for themselves. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's more of a, that's a little bit reformed from my taste, but I, but I get the idea. <laughs> yeah, well, you get the I, idea. I, you get the idea that, that there's a, um, there is an umbrella of influence. Um, it's not an automatic salvation, automatic kind, salvation kind of thing. Kind of right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. so. Oh, I got an echo oh, again. Got an echo again. Who's echoing? I don't know why it just started echoing. All right. We're, we're better now. No, stop. I don't hear any echo. Yeah, it just did it for a minute. All right, so we talked about verse 17. As God has distributed to each one, or given to, uh, meted out, so let him walk, right? So we're talking about vocational language. And so I ordain in all the churches. So now he's speaking. That's definitely apostolic, right? And then this next bit is very similar, almost parallels directly uh, Galatians 3, where Paul talks about circumcision there. So was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. <laughs> but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Right? So, and, which is the same thing he says in Galatians 3. Uh, Galatians 3, 27 to 28. As many of you are baptized into Christ Jesus, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek, circumcised, uncircumcised, right? There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male and female for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. So he's really dealing with the same themes as that and actually in a more expansive way here. But keeping, um, and that word for keep is, is that same, we've talked about this in, in our morning catechesis probably a dozen times in the last month. <laughs> um, this is the same word that sometimes is translated obey. 
We should see what ESV translates it as. Keeping the commandments of God. Okay, so they translate the same as King James. Keeping the commandments of God. So this is the, the Tereo word that means to hold fast, you know, to, um, to treasure. And it's the same word for Mary when she treasures these things in her heart. Right. Right. So keeping, stay with, stay with the word of God, the commandments of God um, is what matters. Not this outward sign of obedience, right? Which has been now set aside um, for everyone, actually. And then I asked this question and I actually found an answer finally. I've been asking this for probably a decade. Is like, how would you ever know, like, which, who is circumcised and who's not in a, in, in a Greek, a Roman Greek society like this? And it turns out I hadn't thought about sport because they competed in sport naked. So, anyway, that's how they would know. They did. They were in the, uh, they were in the Olympics, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. 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 So, that's how they would know. And, and he's just saying, you know, you don't need, and it would actually bring shame on the Jewish athletes, apparently. According to the one commentary I read, because uh, sometimes they were just, it looks like you're eating your coffee. Disfigured, yes, it is true. It's my microphone actually. <laughs> my microphone is the shadow, and then it. Yeah, I see. <laughs> it's fun, whatever. My background's kind of boring. Uh, let's see. And then, again, he repeats what he said in seventeen. Let each one remain in the same calling, and that's vocation, right? Kalao, in which he was called. So then he does just like in, in Galatians 3, were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it, but you can, you can be made free. Um, if you can be made free, rather use it, right? So if you're a slave, stay there, right? Don't worry about it. Um, but if you can get your freedom, then do it, right? But you're, as a Christian, you're not com compelled, you know, you're not free of your slavery, <laughs> right? It's just like if you converted to uh, Christianity while in prison, you're, no, you're still going to be in prison. <laughs> Right? right? But now you're free um, of the condemnation of your sin. You're free from eternal judgment, right? Even while you're still bound and imprisoned um, for what you have done in this life, right? So the same thing here. But if you have an opportunity for freedom, take it. Which, that's pretty good counsel, I think. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freeman. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? So you're a slave, but you're, but you're the Lord's freed man. At the same time. You're, you're in bondage on earth, but you're freed before the Lord. And then likewise, he who is, who is called while free is Christ's slave. Ooh. Ah, see that one. Which is another word for servant. Correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, doulos is the, the Greek word there. Um, it reminds me of, uh, this year is actually the anniversary of Luther's famous uh, On the Freedom of a Christian. Yeah, 1520. The treatise in 1520. So, like two years ago, we celebrated the Heidelberg Disputation, 1518. Uh, 1517, we did the 95 Theses. Uh, what was 1519? What did we do last year? Because for uh, the 1517 conference in October, we celebrate one of the, we remember one of these documents every year. So, this year is, it is the freedom of the Christian, 1527. And he has this famous saying um, about, for although I am free, Oh, no, he's quoting. Where's the quote? I got to find it. Here it is. Uh, and he also, this actually came from the, his, his epistle, uh, Luther's commentary on Romans. Oh, it is a livy, living, busy. Um, no, that's a different quote. How's it go? We're free. I'm sorry, I'm, I lost my place. I have to find it here. It'll come up again in chapter seven or chapter eight, maybe. We're perfectly free. Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. A Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. Luther loved to do this. I'll have to, do, I'll have to say it again to you. A Christian is perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. That's a paradox, right? I mean, how can you be free but also be, be a slave at the same time? And, and what he's talking about is that we're subject to no one in terms of um, salvation, right? Because we've been set free by the Lord. But we are servant of all because we've been bound to them uh, by that same faith that has set us free, has bound us to love our neighbor. So, with the love of Christ. So, and he, he, Luther's just reflecting on what Paul says right here. You're, you're a slave, 
<laughs> well, you're the Lord's freedman, but even if you're free, you're actually Christ's slave at the same time. You are bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Hmm. And I don't know if he means, I think he means that more spiritual than he does physical. Uh, brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. Is that the word? Now see, state was added. How does ESV do that? I forget. So brothers, in whatever condition each one was called, let their, let there let him remain with God. So there, so we have that theme um, said in verse 24, verse 20, and verse 17. So you got the point? <laughs> Just yeah. stay put. You, know, you don't have to run around halfway around the world um, or whatever. You don't have to. You can, right? Yeah, I'm just <laughs> looking. Men, minuto, let him remain. It doesn't actually say condition or state. It's just implied. Um, it's just um, each one uh, in his calling, brothers, in the place according to God. <laughs> that's, that's the literal translation. All right. Now concerning virgins. This gets fun. And, and then you're going to see a lot of the same ideas come on. So I don't know that it'll be quite as heavy here. Uh, concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord. Right, so nothing from the Lord, and yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. Right, so now he's going to speak. He's speaking not really as an apostle, but again as a pastor, but as one who has some experience, right? Because I think we established or suggested that he's a widow. So he knows something about not being married. I suppose, therefore, that it is good, or this is good because of the present distress, which we talked about last week. There's something going on in Corinth. I suggested to you that there's evidence of a famine, right? So there's a bread shortage. Couldn't it have been already some of the persecutions that were? Yeah, probably not. Not in not in Corinth at this time. the The history doesn't line up. That there there was some persecution beforehand. Um, it's possible, but I, I like the famine theory the most. But yeah, I mean, we don't really know. There's something going on that's. One of the reasons why Paul is counseling them to just stay put and don't don't do anything crazy right now. <laughs> um, well, one of the yeah. whole reasons he was writing the letter was because of the, uh, the incest situation in the church. Right. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it does seem that they were acting crazy, you know, and they were being influenced by the world around them. Yeah. But also, that like those women who are divorcing their husbands because it's a higher spiritual state, um, you know, think of the the teaching, you know, be be in the world, but not of the world, right? But for some Christians, especially those who want to live like a monk or a nun, it's like, be not in the world or of the world. It's, it's neither. They're like, well, that's not right. The Lord has placed us in this world. Um, he's given us this world as a gift. Um, and so, uh, I mean, maybe you don't mimic the world in a negative sense, but, uh, but it is still yours. And so don't, don't you know, this escapism, you know, it's one thing to take a retreat and go have a vacation or a break, you know, um, but to, to disconnect completely, I think is what he's getting after here. Anyway, that it is good for a man to remain as he is, right? So again, that same theme again, are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh. Um, but I would spare you, right? So, so he thinks, I don't know what he thinks is going to happen, um, but he's like, just stay where you are. Don't even get married. Don't, you know, unless you have to because you're lusting, right? Because it's, it's not going to go well. So there, I think that that incest situation in the congregation, maybe you're onto something here, Ron. I mean, he talks so much about marriage and, and the issues with people divorcing. It, I, I do get this sense of uh, that his overarching kind of pastoral counsel is just don't do anything until I get there and we can work through this. You know, I can help you sort through this mess because it's such a mess. And, and you're so confused about marriage as a church, as a congregation, um, that it just, just stay where you are. <laughs> I, I do get that impression. And we know, like you said, the incest situation is obviously dramatic and he highlighted that one first. Um, and there's other ones that are going to come up. There's other situations that are going to come up. There's enough problems that he's just saying, you know, you're going to have trouble if you get into this right now. 
And then he says something similar right here in verse 29. But this I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on even those who have wives should be as though they had none, and those who weep as though they did not weep, and those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, and those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use this world as not misusing it, for the form of this world is passing away. Um, this is something that, that, that seems the Church of Corinth is actually believing, that the, that the end is coming soon. Um, because like I said, they're divorcing their spouse, and they're trying to just get everything ready for the Lord's return. Uh, we've lost this sense in, almost entirely, that the Lord could, you know, even just praying that the Lord would come quickly, for example, which is the Advent prayer. Um, but Paul has it in all of his writings, and, and Peter too. They think that the Lord is coming immediately, that he, he's going to show up at any moment, right? And if, I think that 2,000 years that we've had probably has dulled our sense of that kind of both desperation for him to come again, but also... Um, the promise. So he's saying, you know, you can get into all this stuff now, but it's not even going to matter because in, in, in a short moment, it's all going away. Wasn't Isn't there another passage that uh, talks similar to that where the people say it? Um, maybe when, when Christ was actually preaching, all things stay, stay as they were. Yeah. And, and, uh, I forget where it's located. It's even in the Old or New Testament now, but I remember a passage that says uh, the people were kind of dull to yeah to what's happening around them. Well, right. I mean, you can think of the parables that we hear around the end of the church here and then into Advent, you know, um, to watch out for you neither know the day nor the hour, right? Um, you know, that you're busy about your work and you don't even see the Lord coming. Right? Or the... Or the um, the ten virgins with their candles and then, you know, not waiting and watching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So, I, th I mean, liturgically, we've got it in our church here calendar. It doesn't matter which lectionary you use. You're going to get it every year um, for about a month. Well, actually, for about seven weeks. Um, it's the heavy. It's a heavy theme. It's there. And yet somehow, yeah, we just, I don't know if we just don't take it seriously. Um, I don't think we maybe even look forward to it. Maybe we love this world enough. You know that we're we're not willing to leave. So it's it's really kind of hard hard to get your head around that. Uh, you got the, that yeah. passage about you love father and mother more than me, or, mm -hmm. you know, all that too. Yeah, I mean the word here is eschat eschatological. So we live we live um, in the last day. We actually consider you know our time. We're in the millennia. We're in the last day. Uh, the Lord, the Lord is coming soon, and and that's not a bad thing. The Lord is at hand, as um, Paul says in Philippians, I think four. And you know, and that even uh, the Lord prays that the door, and Jesus Himself, He prays in in Jerusalem that those days would be cut short, you know, up for Jerusalem because the destruction is coming, which does end up coming um, by Nero, you know, just about thirty years later. So, yeah, we kind of, I, I think we get lost to that. And that, but then maybe a situation like right now where it seems like everything's going to hell in a handbasket all around us. Um, you know, we have disease and war and rebellion and riot and, and probably war. You know, I mean, they're doing military exercises in the South China Sea. Um, you know, that's a way, that's a wake up call <laughs> to say, yeah. you know, um, maybe um, get your priorities straight and put your cares where they belong, which is with uh, Christ and his word and rather sure. in the things of this world, right? So, and, and which is what he says in, in 32, you know, I don't, I want you to be without care. Um, that, and that word for care is interesting. It's not, yeah, concern is a better translation. You know, the things that you get hung up about, the things that you're always worried about. I want you to be, yeah, this word, I'm looking it up. Uh, free from care, unconcerned, care for, unheeded, yeah. Things that drive you away from other things is another way to think of that. For he who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord, which is absolutely true, right? I mean, maybe. <laughs> I suppose you could use all that freedom, not having a spouse and children to be about other things. Um, but you certainly, you could be, spend that time um, in prayer and in you know, become a teacher or something like that.
He who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife, for example, which we've already talked about, <laughs> you know, the rules as far as um, conjugal visits and all of that. That was a couple weeks ago. There is a difference between a wife and a virgin. And, you know, and all this stuff, oh, it just drives people crazy. Because you're like, you're saying it's, it's okay, you know, to be unmarried? Yeah, it actually is okay for the Christian. This would have driven a, a, a Jewish audience kind of crazy. Um, but Paul's not speaking to Jews primarily. I mean, Jewish converts, but also many Gentile converts here. And so in the Roman society, this isn't as big of a deal. But for a Jew, this would make, this is, it's really amazing that Paul, as a former Jew, is saying any of this because the command was to get married. And as a matter of fact, if you're, if the husband dies, the brother takes his wife <laughs> and bears children for his brother, right? I mean, there was, there's rules. And then Paul's saying, you know what? Don't worry about it. <laughs> An unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Easy enough. And this I say for your own profit, that I may put a leash on you. <laughs> not that ah. I may put a leash on you. That's, that's very important. Yeah, not. Strong negation. But for what is proper, and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. So he's not saying this is a rule, but he is saying, hey, look, this can be an advantage to you, and it can be an advantage to the church. Um, a famous Lutheran, uh, one of the founders of the Missouri Synod, although he never came to America, was uh, Wilhelm Lea from Neuendettelsau, Germany, which is in, uh, uh, that's not Hanover, Neuendettelsau, oh, uh, Franconia, right? So he, he's the one that sent the missionaries to start the, the Franken colonies in, in Michigan, and also the colonies uh, near Amana in Iowa. <clears throat> you said he's from Neu. Say that again. The town is Neuendettelsau. That's where he was the pastor. Little town in the country, not a big place. But here's what he did. It was really incredible. He had a bunch of widows, and and rather than have them marry, he he basically made a nunnery. But it wasn't a nunnery. It it was a diaconate house. It was a house for deaconate. They, he called them deaconesses. There were women um, who were widows who couldn't provide for themselves, and instead he brought them into the service of the church. So they studied God's word. They prayed. Um, in the church daily, and then they made vestments, they made, they kept, kept track of the parents, they made all the communion elements, the bread, the wine, um, and then they served the neighbor, they served their community. Uh, they, had, they were nurses, they did all that kind of stuff. It was really beautiful, yeah. right? Rather than just kind of caging them up in a, in a nursing home or something, um, he gave them opportunity to serve in the church. So, um, That's that was... where all of our relatives are from. I was just looking it up. Same words are very close. Neither Saxon. No, no, that's Hanover. But anyway, never mind. Uh, I but like in, that stuff. <laughs> so uh, Franconi is a little different, but regardless, yeah. the point was, you know, I think he was reflecting on this text to say, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, they could get married again, and there'd be nothing wrong with them marrying again. I mean, you know, we have. I'm thinking of Walt and Ruth in the congregation, right? I mean. <laughs> Hi, Joan. <laughs> I hear you. I'm in the kitchen listening to the Bible study. Can you turn off those other lights then? All right. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, so, I mean, this, it, this, is, this is just like simple pastoral care, right? Just, you know, let's not, it, it's easy, better for you not to be too distracted. So, um, you know, that's okay. It's, it's fine. Cool yeah, it is cool. It is cool. I mean, it would be beautiful to have, you know, an, an elderly, you know, one of our, one of our widows um, that could, you know, just basically be the, the church mouse, right? And just care for all the needs of the, of the, the church building and, and, and help with visitation and all that kind of thing, or have even more than one, especially if they could live at, you know, at the church, if we had some kind of housing. We used to have a, a teacher, Rich. I don't know. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you have uh, a lot of single teachers, too. Yeah, that's true. That's true. All right. So then, like I said, I don't want to. I don't want to let this linger too long. So let's get through this. But if a man, any man, thinks he is behaving improperly toward his his virgin, which I, virgin daughter is probably better, yeah. if she is the past the flower of youth, <laughs> and thus it must be, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin. Let them marry. So I yeah. Uh, that one's a little bit confusing. How does the ESV translate that one? 
If anyone thinks that he's not behaving properly toward his betrothed, oh, that's better. Uh, if his passions are strong and it has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let them marry. It is no sin. Right? So this is marrying someone um, who's single uh, but has no child, uh, is past the childbearing age. It's not a sin to marry. That And that must be a thing too. Like if they can't bear children, then, you know, is that a sinful marriage? <sighs> but it's it's out there. I've heard it. Um, nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, that is over his flesh, and has so determined in his heart that he will keep his betrothed, does well. Uh, so then he gives her, he who gives her in marriage does well, but he who does not give her in marriage does better. So this is just one of these, like, I'm wondering if there isn't a situation there in Corinth that he's responding to directly. It seems like it. Because this is not com this can't be a common situation. But but you know, um, think of um, Fiddler on the Roof, right? And the whole bit about marrying off, <laughs> marrying off the, ch the the daughters, right? I mean, it's just a, it, it's in a Jewish culture. This would have been is very important, you know. Uh, and that they do it while she can still bear children too. I mean, he's Tevia is so concerned about having grandchildren, right? That the family line be carried forth. It's been a long time since I've seen that thing. That movie. <laughs> yeah, me too. There's a there's a couple of footnotes in here that <laughs> help explain at least one explanation the way Paul talks the way he does here. It says um, for verse 29, mm -hmm. Paul urges all believers to make the most of the time before Christ's return. Right. Every person in every generation should have this sense of urgency about telling the good news to others. Life is short. There's not much time. And then in verse 38 and 39 or so, um, some single people feel tremendous pressure to be married. They think their lives can be complete only with a spouse. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. But Paul underlines one advantage of being single, the potential of a greater focus on Christ and his work. If you are unmarried, use your special opportunity to serve Christ wholeheartedly. Singleness, however, doesn't does not ensure service to God. Hmm. Involvement in service depends on the commitment of the individual. True. Yeah. So um, this happens to me often when I visit people who are, um, you know, homebound, single, or otherwise, but maybe physically unable. I mean, it is it is imperative on me um, to provide them opportunity to pray to give them the tools or the resources that they, to help guide their prayers, to remind them how to pray, you know, to direct them towards the Psalms, for example, um, because they may not have ever learned, that's that's one reason, uh, or they may have forgotten, or, or like Paul had been talking about with the cares of this world, you know, as they were raising children or as they were working, um, they, they just didn't really have time for it. And now, so they, they never really had the habit and so I, I have discovered that um, with the, the morning prayer that we've been doing online, there have been a number of people that have remarked, you know, that they've never prayed like that, right? And, and it isn't that they didn't want to, um, but here in this situation, they were forced at home. You know, some, many couldn't work or, or maybe uh, they were just concerned about going out or whatever. <clears throat> and they were given kind of, I guess, opportunity. We would call it opportunity by the Lord then. Um, to to learn how to pray. And that's something um, that, you know, I think that's Paul's point is don't don't be distracted, you know, and and so this happens when people are near death too, is that I usually have to bring them uh, resources, you know, a, a prayer book or a hymnal or, or, or just something like large print that they can read, I don't know if they're having trouble seeing, um, because they'll they'll get caught up in their own thoughts and the imaginations of their hearts um, in a way that even distracts them from, from faith. And I think that's what Paul's concern is here. Good. Um, and then one more teaching on marriage. Remember it started with marriage and then it ends with marriage. I did suggest that was going to happen, right? <laughs> a wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she's at liberty to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. And that one's inter that expression is a little bit obtuse, I think. Um, but if she, she is happier, if she remains as she is, according to my judgment, here again, he's speaking personally, 
It's not, it, he is speaking as an apostle, but it's not quite, I don't think it's quite apostolic testimony. Uh, and I think I also have the spirit of God. <laughs> so maybe he thinks that this is good apostolic counsel, that she can just remain who she, where she is. She doesn't have, to, she doesn't need to marry. All right. When her husband dies. So, I mean, that's a big change of pace for, um, for Christians that, that the Christian ethos around marriage is different than, um, the old Testament one. And I, I think we have to recognize that. Uh, that isn't to say that we don't commend people to marriage and we don't promote marriage as being um, God pleasing, um, and, and certainly the proper outlet for, you know, all the hormonal distress of the young people. You know, <laughs> it's good. And the, but it, I mean, it's a serious commitment too, because he, like he started out, the Lord's teaching is don't you don't divorce, right? And uh, um, and you never divorce a believing spouse. And then he said, if, if an unbelieving spouse wants to leave, you can let them leave. Um, but you can try, I mean, you can try to keep them too. I mean, that, that's not wrong. So there, there is a, there's, there's a hardness and there's a flexibility. Um, the hardness is between believers. The flexibility is where there's unbelievers involved. And I think that's the important note there. You know, those who deny God's word or don't believe it, um, you know, you might have to let them go. So this idea of being detached. I'm going to take this call. Ron, Edward. Yeah, go ahead. That's fine, Ron. Let's just shield it for a minute. Well. <laughs> yeah, it is Ron. Mm -hmm. I can yeah. mute him. We'll, un we'll mute him for now. All mm -hmm. right. So, um, uh, yeah, at the end, that last bit, um, where is it that I was looking at? Oh, 731, yeah. For the form of this world is passing away. I think that that's kind of an overarching theme for the end, isn't it? You know, just, mm -hmm. uh, we're facing the end, and time is coming, drawing short, you know? So make the best use of the time, and uh, don't get too hung up on things either, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of the end of this section, right? I think so. Right. And, and it is 9.31. It's time. Yeah, because chapter 8 gets a lot more fun with uh, food sacrifice to idols. And then... Uh, it's a short chapter. Yeah, but the, the, stuff, with, the stuff with idols and idolatrous food goes all the way through chapter 11. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, because because like the end of chapter ten is about um, mixing the Lord's table and with the Lord the table of demons. So I, idolatrous turning the Lord's table into an idolatrous food. So so yeah, it's it's it. He kind of gets off the path a little bit um, where he talks about his apostolic um, uh, kind of authority in chapter nine, but then he comes right back to it with with idolatrous food in chapter 10 and especially the fathers in the wilderness and complaining about the food there so he draws a connection between food sacrifice to idols and then the way that the the um the nation of israel treated the food in the wilderness and then he goes to the lord's supper so so the the food thing is a running theme for about three chapters this so, is a whole tough yeah. book to go through actually it is a tough book to go through i've never i've never done it in this kind of detail so i'm glad we're doing it um and, and kind of handling some of these harder texts too yeah just trying to get the context a little bit and understand you know what what's paul getting after here and i think the real helpful thing um is to recognize this way that that you got to pull back to context and see is he does he set you up to say i'm speaking you know, as an apostle, am I speaking just as a, you know, as a pastor to this church, or am I speaking on behalf of the Lord, right? And then that means that what he says thereafter has a different level of authority, you know, towards us especially, um, but even towards the, his hearers. And uh, we're not that nuanced in our thinking sometimes, <laughs> you know? Um, this would be helpful, like when people say, well, you Christians don't follow all the Levitical laws, for example. You know, if you followed all those laws, then you wouldn't eat shellfish, and, you know, you just like to pick and choose from the Bible. It's like, well, that's a really shallow reading of the Bible, to recognize, um, you know, that there, that there isn't 
different categories of law that some apply, you know, eternally and some apply temporally. Some are given to only particular people, you know, or given to a particular individual for just a time. Um, you got it. You, you did it read the well, book. There's, there's a difference between before Christ and after Christ. Yeah, too. right. Exactly. Well, and what does Christ do? I mean, does he does he continue the sacrifices in the temple? No, no, because he he assumes all of them into himself. They all point to him. Right. So yeah, it's good to read the Bible actually in large swaths like this, so that you can actually right. you can see the nuance of how things are being communicated. Um, I remember and then, reading a. Um, an article probably in could have been on Patheos or could have been in Luther Witness, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Um about looking at marriage as a type of union between same as Christ and, and the church. Right. I mean so I mean that's a whole different area than what we studied here, but right. It, it's um a, one is like the other in a I don't know what how would I explain it to well, it's type and anti-type. Second meaning or a second mm -hmm. type? Yeah, what, well, what Paul does in Ephesians 5, which is he's speaking to a very different situation there, um, is that he says that marriage was given to Adam and Eve. He made them male and female to sh to, and, and then joined them together as husband and wife to show them and us in our marriages the relationship of Christ and the church that was from before the foundation of the world. Right. So the marriage was actually given after, and not in a in a time sense, but in a in a like in the mind of God, right? He's like, I'm going to give my son as um, to to my people um, as the bridegroom, and so then I'm going to make them male and female, and I'm going to join them together so that they can see what this relationship is going to be like, you know, of a family and children, and that, and then they're going to be brought into my family. It's really kind of a beautiful way. Of, like mm -hmm. Paul turns it on your head and say, Christ didn't come along and say, you know, that marriage thing. I'm going to take that and I'm going to make it something new. It's the other way around. Come along and say the marriage thing. That marriage, all those marriages, the imperfect ones, the perfect ones, whatever, those were all pointing forward to me and what I was coming to do from before any of it was given in the first place. Which is, just get your head around the time circle that way. <laughs> it's a big loop. Yeah, it's beautiful right. though. It's, it's beautiful. the big picture, I guess. Yeah, it is the big picture. It is the big picture. Right. And, that, and well, that's a good way to kind of end this is that Paul wants to get you get get the church in Corinth here to the big picture, get them out of the muck and the mire and messing around with all this worldliness and and to be about the thing that matters, right, which is uh, Christ and his word, right? Mm -hmm. To walk in the calling to which they've been called. And mm -hmm. um, you know, not get too hung up about <laughs> these really secular matters um and to focus on um serving the Lord without distraction.